Welcome to part four of this video series. So far, we have created an ERD, DDL, written some SQL, and discussed acid compliance and transactions. If you want to catch up, those videos are all linked below, as is a SQL file that contains all the commands we have executed so far. In this video, we are going to be making our interactions more efficient through the use of stored procedures and triggers. This is how we do it. A stored procedure is a small function or program that we write uh, for our database, and it can allow us to do multiple things programmatically in one operation. Now, in addition to this making it more simple to interact with our data, this can also improve the security of our database because we're not exposing the underlying data structure to the users or to the application. All of the interaction with the data goes through the stored procedure, so we're able to uh, control what users or applications can do with a little bit more granularity. So let's go back and take another look at the two actions that happen when a user purchases something at our grocery store. So as we've discussed, when a customer makes a purchase, there are two things that we want to do. We want to insert into the line item table uh, to record their purchase, and then we want to update the product table in order to uh, make sure our inventory is up to date. So, but instead of executing these two separate commands, what we can do to make this a little bit easier is to create a stored procedure. And then we just call the stored procedure, pass the relevant values into it, and the stored procedure will take care of everything for us. So in order to do that, we are going to use the create function command, or uh, we can say create or replace if we want to have the flexibility to uh, update the stored procedure if it already exists. But we say create or replace function, and then the name of the stored procedure that we are creating, and then the uh, name of any variables and the data type of the variables of anything that we want to pass in to the stored procedure. So what we're going to do in this case is pass in a value for customer ID. We're going to pass in a value for product ID, which is going to be the UPC. And we're going to pass in a value for quantity. Okay, And then in our stored procedure, recall that in the line item table, we also record the date of the purchase. But in our stored procedure, instead of passing in the date, we're just going to use the current date uh, from the system. So that kind of saves a step there. So create or replace function purchase. Here are the values that we're going to be passing in. Uh, this function is going to return a Boolean uh, value of true when it completes. And then this as dollar sign dollar sign, this is where the actual content of our stored procedure starts. So because we want to make sure that we are uh, ACID compliant, we are going to wrap this up as a transaction with the word begin here. And then we have our two SQL statements inserting into the line item table and updating the product table. And then we have to return a value to uh, indicate that this completed successfully. So we're going to return true and then end our transaction. And then we have to end with this little line here that says the language is a PLP GSQL. So there's a little bit of a modification that we've had to make to the SQL that we're executing in this stored procedure. And in particular, so this should look pretty familiar so far, uh, we say insert into line item, and then here are the attributes in the line, able t line item table, customer ID, UPC, purchase date, and quantity values. But then instead of specifying uh, the values like we normally would, we are we're, we're specifying the variables that we've defined in our function. So whatever we pass into the stored procedure for customer ID is going to go here. Whatever we passed into the stored procedure for product ID is going to go here. Current date is going to be returned from the system as the current date. And then whatever we passed in for quantity is going to be used here. Okay, And kind of a similar thing for our update portion of the function is uh, we're going to update product set quantity on hand equal to the quantity on hand minus whatever quantity we passed into the stored procedure where the UPC is equal to whatever product ID we passed into the stored procedure. Okay, 
So I'm going to highlight all of this and execute. So function purchase created. That's good news. Okay, now so we can see the effect of our stored procedure, uh, I'm just gonna take a quick look at our line item table right now, uh, order by purchase date descending. Uh, so you can see the latest purchase that we had was uh, on 821. And so now if we call our stored procedure purchase, and we're gonna do this with the select statement, and it's kind of an odd approach to it. Some other DVMSs use uh, the keyword call to uh, call a stored procedure. Some say exact, there are a couple of different approaches, but in Postgres, you say select, then the name of the stored procedure, and then the values for the variables that you're passing in. So our customer ID, our UPC, and then the quantity. So this is customer 101, we'll be purchasing two units of product one, two, three, four. And when we execute this, we get this value of true return because it worked. And now when we look at our line items again, we see we have a purchase from customer 101, UPC 1234, uh, quantity two, and this is on today's purchase date. So instead of executing these two SQL queries, we can just execute this stored procedure and pass these three variables and our three values into it, and everything is good. Now, another valuable thing we can do is to create a trigger. And what a trigger does is to look for certain events to occur, for example, a table being updated, and then do something else in response to that event occurring. So for example, when we update our product table and we uh, take away from the quantity on hand, we might fire a trigger to check and see if that quantity on hand has fallen below some threshold. And if it has, then maybe we uh, write a record to another table in our database in order to uh, indicate that we need to replenish that. So why don't we give that a try? Uh, to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and just create a table called reorder. And uh, whenever we put something into the reorder table, um, Postgres is just going to automatically apply a, uh, a unique identifier number to it. That's what this uh, serial uh, option is doing. And we're just going to insert the UPC and the quantity that we want to reorder. Okay, so we're just simply creating a table there and now we're going to create a new stored procedure that the trigger is going to execute. Okay, so we're creating a stored procedure here called restock. And uh, basically we just say if the quantity on hand is less than 10, then we're going to insert into reorder the UPC and the quantity and the values that we're going to insert are the UPC and a quantity of 50 is what we're going to uh, reorder. And that's just a, a number that I uh, made up. And so when you're interacting with triggers, you can get the value of the attribute before the, uh, before the operation that triggered the trigger occurred and the value of it after. And we refer to that as new and old. So if the new quantity on hand is less than 10, that's the quantity on hand after the trigger was executed, then we're gonna do this. Uh, old.qoh would have given us the quantity on hand before the trigger was executed, okay? So we're going to create this stored procedure, which the trigger is going to use, and then we're going to create a trigger, and we're gonna call it check inventory, which is going to fire after the table product is updated. And then for each uh, row that was updated in this update statement, it's going to execute the stored procedure restock, which is going to check to see if the quantity on hand is now less than 10. And if it is, it's going to uh, add a record to the reorder table. Okay, so we've created that trigger. And uh, let's, uh, let's take a look. Well, first of all, our reorder table should currently be empty. Yeah, there's nothing in our reorder table. And let's see if we have any products that we're getting 
uh, kind of low on, oh, we're very low on Doritos, and, but it's not in the reorder table because Doritos being low happened before we created this trigger, before we were monitoring it. Um, but chicken, chicken is low. Uh, that's number two, three, four, five. So if we execute our stored procedure of purchase, and we're gonna say customer 101 is going to purchase product 2345, uh, which is chicken, and they're gonna purchase three chickens, which should put our quantity down to nine. Okay, so that worked. If we look at our line item table, we should see, yeah, customer 101 purchased, um, oh, let's order by perch date descending. We see customer 101 purchased product 2345, a quantity of three of them, which should have made the quantity of chicken drop down to nine, which means we now should have in our reorder table a, uh, a row that says we need to order 50 chickens. And let's see, yep, we need to order 50 units of 2345. Okay, so that trigger fired when we updated the product table, and because the quantity on hand dropped before, below nine, then it wrote to the reorder table that we need 50 units of item two, three, four, five. So that's stored procedures and triggers in a nutshell. There's a lot of great functionality that you can do with these tools. Um, so I would encourage you to play around with that. That's it for this video. In the fifth and final video coming up, we are going to be discussing views and materialized views. We'll see you there.